Hey there. Um, I am John Hartness, founder and publisher of Falstaff Books, and this is our very first author interview. Um, obviously, we're not doing our typical book babble where Melissa and I sit in the lobby of a hotel or in a hotel room with our author friends and talk about books because, well, this is a this is a time of quarantine. It's unprecedented in our in our lifetimes, at least. So. I'd like to welcome AJ Hartley <laughs> because I could see him drinking and I was like, oh, let's screw with him right now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And we're glad to have you. Um, we're going to talk primarily about your newest release, Impervious, which will be out today, April 23rd, which is when this video is airing. And... This is, the, this is not the first book you've done with Falstaff, but it's the first original release that you've done with us. Um, just in case anybody who follows the press on YouTube has no idea who you are, why don't you tell people a little bit about what you've written and some of the folks you've worked with and things like that. Okay, uh, sure. Um, so Impervious will be my 23rd novel. That's um, yeah, I, and I've written lots of different things for different age groups, different genres, different publishers. Um, I did a, a series of mystery thriller, ar archaeological mystery thrillers. When I, that's how I started uh, with Penguin years ago. Um, and then I did a couple of fantasy novels, Act of Will and Willpower for Tor, which uh, are now Falstaff books. Yes, we released um, those. And then I also did a couple of Shakespeare retellings that I wrote with David Hewson, performed for specifically for audio. They were commissioned by Audible. The Macbeth was performed by Alan Cumming. The Hamlet was performed by Richard Armitage. And oh. that actually won... Uh, Audible's book of the year for, I forget what year it was, 2016 maybe, something like that. Well, you know, it's too bad you couldn't get some talent to work on those. <laughs> I've been very lucky with audio books, actually. Um, you know, the, the, I did a ste the Steeplejack series, which is a, a YA, slightly steampunky uh, thriller set in a world that looks kind of like Victorian South Africa and is very driven by sort of racial politics and such. And that was performed for audio by Noma de Mezwene, who is currently playing Hermione Granger in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child on Broadway. I mean, obviously well, not at the moment. Not tonight. Broadway shut down. But she was the, you know, the original Hermione for the UK production, and then it transferred to, to the States. I She's didn't know she was still with the show. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I... Um, I'm a, I haven't spoken to her for a little while, so I'm assuming that I don't know what's going on with the show. Maybe the, no, the COVID-19 I mean, thing has meant that she had to go back to the UK, and I don't know what. Anyway, what else? Um, I did a series called, oh, while we're talking about audiobooks, I did a couple of ghost stories, Cold Bath Street and Written Stone Lane, yeah. set in my hometown in the UK in the late 70s, which is when I was growing up. And you really had to suffer through that narrator, too. <laughs> uh, that was performed for audio by Christopher Eccleston, um, who a lot of you will know as the ninth Doctor Who. Um, I actually had him uh, at the moment. I'm also a Shakespeare professor. And so at the moment, all my classes are online. And I had Chris uh, Skyping into my class last week, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, because we had just done the Revengers tragedy, and there is basically one movie of the Revengers tragedy in which Chris Eccleston plays Indice, the lead character, with uh, Derek Jacobi and Eddie Izzard. Odd. So, yes, indeed. It's an odd film, but a great film in many ways. So we had him in class talking about that, which was cool. Um, and he and we'd also taught Macbeth, and he was Macbeth a couple of years ago for the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, what else? I did the Darwin Arkwright series, which is a trilogy for middle grade. Um, 
Oh, and I also, I write as Andrew Hoyt. Uh, also, I've done a series of uh, thrillers for one of the Amazon houses, Lake Union. Um, and I'm, is that it? There's probably, oh, oh, oh. No, there's another, there's another, but we were, I was, we can save that one because I have a specific uh, reference to tie that series in later. Okay. <laughs> okay. So as you can tell, I, I, I'm all kind of all over the place. I write lots of different things. I kind of like, I kind of write the books that I feel like reading at the time, you know? Um, so, and, and that has always been my MO, much to my agent's <laughs> disappointment, I'm sure, um, because this is not the way to, to build a brand. As they it, is pretty, it is pretty diametrically opposed to what a lot of people are told. Smart people, you mean? No. I mean, it seems to have worked out okay. You've got 23 books out now, or yeah, you've got 23 books out now. So I think you're doing all right. Yeah. And, you know, a few people buy them even, so. Indeed. But imagine if I'd done 23 Jack Reacher novels. <laughs> yeah. And how bored would you have gotten? I, would, I, couldn't, have, I, I couldn't have done it, no. no. Right. You know, for a long time, when people have talked to me about whether or not they should pick a different name for each genre they write in, mm. you were my standard for saying no. Then mm. Amazon made you, come, made you cut your name in half. Yeah, yeah. But let's... But we're not here to talk about those books that other people publish. <laughs> we're here to talk about your new book, Impervious. So mm -hmm. tell the folks at home, tell the folks at home what you're doing, Roger. Um, so this is a, a YA, it's a young adult novel set in a high school, follows a, uh, a girl called Trina Warren, who... Um, is an ordinary kid in many respects. And then one day she gets a necklace from an anonymous donor. It shows up. She, and, soon, and it has a little sword on it, on the necklace. And she's a, she's a fantasy and, and sci-fi geek. She, she loves uh, all the sort of movies and books and, and TV shows that many of us uh, enjoy. Uh, in that sort of fantasy sci-fi kind of area. So she gets this necklace and suddenly she has this heightened awareness of blades, knives, machetes, swords, ultimately, um, and, and a sort of strange facility with them. She's always been sort of clumsy and now suddenly she's this sort of elegant and graceful figure. Um, and she's told that this is because she has been sort of co-opted by a kind of angel spirit um, enshrined somehow in this necklace and that she has a destiny to um, protect her immediate environment and in a sense her world against something bad which is coming. And that's the story. The story then is about, you know, what, what happens as she goes through this experience. So it is, it's a closed world fantasy in the sense that she starts off in our world and then that world becomes fantastical around her. Right. Um, but that's not the story of the book. That's the, no. that's the story in the book. Yeah. But... By the way, this interview will contain spoilers because I don't think, as we've discussed, we can't really talk about the book without talking about the framework of the book. Yeah. So you mentioned that you're a Shakespeare professor. Mm. 51 weeks ago, something really shitty happened. Yeah. Um, I was at UNC Charlotte where I teach and for a end of year celebration of our students, the students who are graduating. So it's a sort of a party and the faculty do little speeches to honor each of the students who are graduating. So it's, it's a very sort of familial kind of thing. 
and we were just about to start when we were told that there was a shooting on campus that had just started uh, and so we uh, this and we heard this before we were given any kind of official warning or statement or anything like that this broadcast stuff had kicked in so we locked ourselves in rooms with students um i was in a dressing room in the, because we were in the, the black box theater um in in robinson hall um and I, so i locked myself in a dressing room with with uh, a half dozen students and we waited for two hours or so um trying to track what was going on through our phones and we did get what you know instructions and warnings through the emergency broadcast system but we were also getting reports that we didn't know how many shooters there were or how many people had already been killed um and so on so it was it was obviously a very stressful situation um that's a very british way of putting it yeah you might be underselling it a little i mean you have to be at, at the time you know i i that's kind of how i felt about it it was a very strange thing because i didn't feel panicked um, I mean, we couldn't hear anything, you know, as I, I've said elsewhere, um, theaters are built to be soundproof. Right. Right. So we didn't hear gunshots. We didn't hear the people running around. We had no idea what was going on. And we were told, stay where you are until the SWAT teams come through and clear the building. Um, and so, I don't know, part, maybe, maybe it's the British thing. Maybe it's because I'm a teacher. Right. I mean, you, you did have to be the adult in the room. Yeah. But it wasn't just me. I think most of them were fairly calm. And, and some of it was a sense of unreality. And some of it was a sense of this is what happens in America. And today is our turn. Um, and so at the time, it was sort of strange. And then as we came out of it, and obviously the campus was in chaos, and I've never seen so many police cars in my life outside our building, because they were all parked in that area. There were dozens and dozens of police cars with their lights going, and students filing out with their hands over their heads and being escorted out by police and so on. Um, and, you know, so it started to register a little bit more then. But it didn't really hit me for a couple of days that um, that I was sort of traumatized by it, you know. And um, it was a really strange experience that weird things would set me off, you know, stuff watching on TV or reading in a book or something. And sometimes things that I couldn't place at all. I was in the grocery store one, you know, a few days after the event and suddenly i just sort of panicked and this is so not me you know um and had this sort of strange desire to sort of get everybody out of the building because they didn't understand how much danger they were in it was really odd you know um so things like that were happening and it was a, a, almost like ptsd which i couldn't understand because i hadn't seen anything i hadn't really you know as I say, I hadn't heard anything. And in real terms, as it became apparent what had actually happened, in real terms, I don't think I was ever in, in actual danger, you know, because it was con confined to a single classroom um, and uh, two students were killed and four others were, sh were, were also shot before this, the, the, the shooter was uh, overpowered and, um, and, and taken by the police. And it all happened very fast. Mm -hmm. The problem was that for us, we didn't know that. And we were being told maybe there's a second shooter, there were bombs in buildings, you know. So, so for us, it was this sort of long process. But, but after the fact, I couldn't, it was like I had to try to convince myself that actually I was perfectly safe and had been probably for the whole time, you know. 
And in the end, I did what I tend to do in these situations, which is that I decided I was going to write this novel. And a, f- a, a version of this novel had been kicking around in my head for a while, where um, it would look and feel like a fantasy novel, but at key points in the narrative, the fiction would break down and you mm-hmm. would see that, in fact, there was something very real and ordinary going on. And, and you would discover that the character was actually living through some sort of school shooting. And so I had kicked this idea around for a number of years, but never quite. And I, I'd even done some outlining of it, but I'd never actually written any of it. And for whatever reason, partly because I had other projects going on and I just didn't get around to doing it. And then suddenly I woke up one morning and I was like, okay, I'm going to write that book and I'm going to write it now. And so I did. I wrote the first draft in 13 days when I was doing absolutely nothing except writing and eating and sleeping. And that was it. And it just sort of came out. That's, that's fast. That's it, it, it's certainly fast for, for me. Yeah. That's 4,000 words a day. That's fast. That's, that's a lot of words. Yeah. But it, it took, I don't know why, but it took very little thought and planning. Often when I'm working, even, um, even when I feel like I'm writing quickly, I need time between writing sessions to build a sense of where the story is going to go, or I need a really good outline to work from that I've drafted in advance. And this time it didn't really go like that. And part of it was that I had deliberate, I decided that I didn't want it to be a long book because I knew that so much of it was going to depend on how it finished. Um, and I didn't want, and because in my own experience of it, the whole thing had gone by in a couple of hours and much of the actual event had been much shorter than that. So I didn't want something that felt like it took a long, long time. I wanted it to be almost a real time read. You know? I think it's very close to that. Um, yeah. It's not a long book. It's less than 200 pages. Um, is it? Yeah. It bumps right up. I think the hardcover is 194. Huh. So it's what, if, like 60,000 words, something like that. 52, I think. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. It's, it's not a long book. And I think I I think I read it the first time in four hours. Hmm. I think Melissa said she read it in about three. Right. I took a break. I yeah. probably had something like this that I had to do for sure. forty five minutes or so in the middle. Yeah. But yeah, it it is close to um oh which Greek guys the three the Aristotle's the, the, the in terms of structure, you mean? Yeah, the continuity and da 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 da. You know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. It is close. It does. It is pretty close to that. So you wrote it in two weeks. Yeah, and then you cleaned it up a little. I cleaned it up a little, not enough. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I was so close to. It. I mean, obviously, when you you put that much energy into something you're kind of living it. Oh yeah. Which was in some ways the point. But right. in, in being that close to it, it meant that I, I couldn't, it, it took me a while before, you know, I could edit it properly. And, and so I cleaned it up some, but it wasn't really until Melissa uh, started going through copy edits that I started to see, you know, th- those, those sort of writer habits that you don't notice, you know, the repeated words and mm-hmm. phrases and things that keep popping up. And I don't know about you, but I know for me, it's it's like I pick a new word every book that I use too much for this book. Yeah, Melissa yeah. probably has a list somewhere of all of mine that I've gone through. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So th- that really helped. But yeah, I mean, it was pretty much as written. Yeah. And then what happened? Because that was that was a month after the event yeah so So over a year after right um so the book went on the market 
and it went to you know all my usual editors um and then a, a whole bunch of others and you know a, and nobody wanted it um and what was really odd is that and i've done this a lot you know so i know what re rejection letters look like and usually especially when it's somebody you've worked with before or when somebody you tend to get a lot of description, get a few sentences saying what they liked and then why well, they decided not to pursue it. And that's normal. Hold on just a second because we hit up there. Your, your video and audio hiccuped for a second. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go back to, you know, what rejection, you know what rejection letters look like with editors that you worked with before. So, yeah, I, I, I've been around the block a lot of times. I know what rejection letters look like because my agent will forward to me whatever was said to her. And usually you'll get a few sentences saying, here's what I liked, here's what I thought worked. And then some, you know, if it's like, but for whatever reason, here's why I'm going to pass. You know, and it's usually pretty clear, clear. With this, we got nothing. Most of the people who rejected it simply didn't respond. And many of those who did made real, the, the, the rejections were incredibly short. And to my mind, if, if, for example, I was looking to revise it for a resubmission, utterly unhelpful. They would say things like, well, I didn't connect with the voice. And I was like, and given the nature of the book, this was so bizarre. And it seemed to me, and, and maybe, maybe this is not fair, but it really seemed like people were just scared of the issue and nobody wanted to go near it. And, and obviously there are other school shooting books. Yes. That was something I was going to bring be, up. Go is, ahead. Is that there's a, it's, it's not even a small chunk. There's a bunch of school shooting books out there. Two things though. I don't know that there's any of them that are fantasy. Right. They're all YA novel novels, like, yeah. you know, your John Green style. Yeah. They're, they're issue books. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know that anyone who's actually been through one yeah. has written a fictional account. I don't know of anybody, but I mean, maybe my, my research in that area is inadequate. No. So I don't know. I, I, and a part of me thought that, that would make publishers interested, that the fact that this was something I'd been through would be considered a positive thing that gave me some authority about speaking about the experience. But again, for whatever reason, no one wanted to know. And we're not talking about five. No. We're talking a couple dozen. Yeah, I would say so. Maybe even more. And this isn't the same as when a first-time novelist mm -hmm. doesn't hear back or doesn't get an answer. This is your 23rd book, and you've sold well over a million books in your career. Yeah. This isn't you've, you're a New York Times bestseller, USA Today bestseller, Audible Amazon best uh, all of the all of the boxes. I mean, I'm pretty sure you haven't won an Oscar, but you check a lot of the boxes. Right. So I was baffled. Melissa, Melissa read this book for you very early in the process. She was one of your beta readers. And she came to me and said, if we get any chance, buy this book. And I said, Well. AJ has a standing offer. He knows I'll publish his grocery list. But I'm sure somebody else will pick this book up. Yeah. And then when they didn't, I was, it was not the first or last baffling move New York Publishing has done that I frankly am benefiting from as a small press because we're picking up projects by incredible authors like yourself, like David Coe, that bigger presses aren't taking. But it did, this does feel like it's the issue. Now- I think, as, as you say, you know, I, I think the idea, I, I think what they couldn't get their head around, I'm guessing, 
I wonder if part of what they can't get their head around is the idea of taking an incredibly serious real life issue and framing it as a fantasy adventure. And it's that that is where they see the conflict. That, that they'll do issue books if it's sufficiently sober and serious and realistic and it's front loaded as, no pun intended, yeah. as um, a book about this issue. Whereas this is a different kind of a story, you know? And yet one of the best selling YA series at the time it wasn't YA because it didn't really exist then of all time started being written so that a stepfather could help his kid deal with his mother's death. And that's the Narnia books. Right. Yeah. I mean, fantasy has always dealt with issues. Oh, absolutely. Um, And obviously anybody who knows, you know, the previous fantasy stuff that I have done, you know, they know that I'm, I'm always going to engage with, with issues that are important to me. Um, sure. I mean, Steeplejack had, mm. like you said, it a big chunk of the book uh, and the series was centered on racial politics and race, race relations and things of that nature. Yeah. 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 So is this a gun book? Is it a gun control book? Um, you know, my attitude is that, yes, it is. But I don't know that that's necessarily what readers will take away from the core of the story. They might not. Um, I think, you know, in some ways it's a novel about heroism and sacrifice and those kind of broad concerns. But for me, ultimately... Is this a book that I hope will make people think about this issue as something that happens a lot and and that we have become sort of oddly complacent about until it happens in your own backyard? You know, I mean, we're, we're living through this pandemic uh, seclusion at the moment, and it is really striking that how how most of us I don't think really took it that seriously until you start getting a sense that maybe people you know have the disease or people have died and you start and, and that's when you start to sort of say, hmm, maybe there is something here to be concerned about. Maybe we need to do something about it. Well, we were together at a conference the week before things started locking down in the US. I hosted i produced that conference Mm. and we took it we took it seriously we were engaging in social distancing to some degree even then but nothing like we probably should have Right, right it was the same weekend as a funeral in southwestern georgia that became a nexus for the disease in that community. I feel like we got really lucky Mm. that there wasn't someone sick at our event Mm. that didn't share that with 200 people. Yeah. So my point is just that that sense of the proximity of an abstract problem, when you get close to it and suddenly you feel touched by it and I was touched by it in a, in a sort of literal way. And I kind of wanted the book to touch people in a slightly different way so that they would, they would experience it kind of, they would go through it with these fictional characters and maybe it will make people reflect on the issue. Now, one of the ways I think you do a really good job of tying people to the book, and this is something that you and I share. We're big music nerds. And the music in this book is really important. And you've got a couple of connections in the music industry. Like I <laughs> mentioned earlier, uh, you write a series of books with Tom DeLong, who was the lead singer of Blink-182 and Angels and Airwaves. So... Talk a little about the music in this book. Um, you know, uh, obviously, w- w- certainly when I was in the equivalent of an American high school, 
um, music, and it was different then, I think, uh, a little bit. We could maybe talk about why, but music was how we defined ourselves. Music Absolutely. was like one of those sort of aspirational points where you say, especially if you're comparatively working class, right? You're raised in a sort of, in, in my case, an industrial northern English town where things like music as a way of saying this is what I value this is who I am you know um, and so that that and you, you know what it's like when you hear a song from your adolescence and you're right back there oh yeah take you all the way and so albums that transport me to my freshman year of college absolutely yeah the yeah. first Indigo Girls album the first Tori Amos album all of those tie very closely to very specific the first Black Crows album takes me back to the summer of 1990. So, you know, so I, I and, and I, I have a, a teenage son who's about to go to college and I see the way that he connects to music, you know, in, in analogous ways to the way that I did. So I wanted some of that to sort of find its way into the book as a, a, a way of stamping a, a particular kind of presence in the, in the story without breaching copyright, which is always right. the trick when you're writing fiction, right? Yeah. You reference, you reference one particular song that I didn't know the story behind this song until our, our copy editor who helped with the book, Melissa MacArthur, until she messaged me and she mm -hmm. said, AJ just broke me. And I said, what? She said that song that she talks about, it's, it's I Don't Like Mondays. And I said, yeah, I know the song, but what's the deal? Hmm. So where'd that song come from, AJ? Because I, mean, I bet a lot of people don't know the story behind that song. Yeah, it, um, it was one of the first, I mean, I, I can't remember what year it came out, but I would have been around Trina's age when I first heard it. And it was a, it was a big hit, the Boomtown Rats. Um, it was a, a, with Bob Geldof on, on lead vocals, um, and it was a big hit in the UK, but it was not about a UK experience. I Don't Like Mondays was maybe the first pop culture reference I ever heard to school shootings. And I had no idea that's what the song was about. Yeah. The, because... the, it was a particular, I, I want to say it was in California, I think. I think so. Um, and she and a, a girl uh, shot up the class. And when they, when she was asked by the police or the journalists, I forget who, why she had done it, she said she didn't like Mondays. And that was uh, obviously the, the genesis of the, of the song. And, and there have been other songs since, you know, that touch on similar things. But for me, I think that was the first one. And I wanted to find a way to sort of, slide it into the story as if it's the character's subconscious articulating something about what's happening. But of course it's not her age group. So it had to be a song that she knew through her father. Right. It was 1979. 79. Yeah. When it was released. So that makes that? Perfect sense. middle school. Middle school. No. Remember I'm very old. I forget that you're, that you're, older that our age difference is bigger than i always okay. think i always so think i was 15 in 1979 okay yeah that also explains why i never knew the story because i was six in 1979 right so. right yeah and but we're both of an age now to have teenage children so yeah. it's perfectly reasonable that your son could have heard the song as you listened to it or if i had children and we're all very happy that I don't mm. but, but I could not absolutely pass that along it, it, it's a it's a it's funny that you mention it because in some ways it was songs like that when I was that age it was songs like that that said pop culture can touch on important things yeah you know, that that and, and whether we're talking about music or whether we are talking about uh, TV shows, you know, it's funny also with my son, we have recently been 
introducing him to Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Right. And we actually just watched the episode with when in the clock tower. When with Jonathan in the clock tower with the rifle, when she, when Buffy can hear what everybody's thinking, and obviously that episode goes in a very different direction. Though I actually found it quite hard to watch this time, for for all the reasons that we've been talking about. But again, it was that sense that a show that can be fun and playful and funny can also sort of dip into these serious things, and and that to me is what makes this stuff worth doing, right? I mean, so when people tell me, you know, fantasy novels, that's no place for serious issues, it's no place for (laughs) politics or anything, I'm like, I don't know what you people have been reading, but it's nothing that I'm interested in. I mean, Mercedes Lackey books were the first time I ever was introduced to a homosexual character that wasn't being mocked. It was the first time I ever saw a homosexual character portrayed as a hero and from a very rural working class upbringing in the southeastern united states that changed my view it changed my mind about people because i read a book i read a fantasy book I mean, and, and obviously I'm a Shakespeare professor, so that this sort of idea that what was effectively pop culture can be rich and complex and generative of really powerful and compelling ideas is kind of central to what I do. So of course yeah. I'm going to try and do that in my own work. And there might have been a few political and race relations style issues in Shakespeare. Of course. One or two, maybe. Yeah. Melissa, <clears throat> I, I pinged her and said, all right, I'm going to interview H.A. about the book. What should I ask? And she said, what if this book is taught in a class? And she thinks it should be. Um, I do, too, because I would love to see every school district in the country buy 30 copies for every school. Um, if this book were to be taught in a class, what do you think, what do you want people to get from it? And are there things that have deeper meanings or are the curtains just blue? Or in this case, is the chair just red? Hmm. Um, I, th- I mean, obviously, uh, I, I do want people to talk about the core issue. I do want people to talk about gun laws and gun availability, and the way we think about freedom. Um, And again, and we're having versions of this conversation about coronavirus as well. The way we think about personal freedoms and the limitation of personal freedoms, frequently we don't seem to think, we don't want to talk about how my brand of freedom might be a significant infringement on your freedom. Yeah. The idea that your rights end where my where my nose starts. Yeah, yeah. That's not really how that works, unfortunately. Right. So, you know, these issues, I think, can be discussed both philosophically in the abstract, but also fairly practically in terms of, you know, looking at, at, these, at these issues and ha- how these things work and how we might want them to work better because I think we should all be thinking about this stuff all the time. Um, I also think, of course, that like the conversation we've just been having, I would love a book like this to be about how story can do more than one thing at once. You know, how we can, we can talk about, we can talk about this as a fantasy adventure um, Mm. Uh, and how it gets sort of layered and complicated when you start to realize what is actually going on in the, in the narrative. But that doesn't mean that the fantasy adventure part is just a sort of blind, that, that it's a, an irrelevance, that it's, it's clearly not, that a lot of the sort of the emotional journey of the character is in the book of the novel, which is in that closed world of the fantasy, you know, and what she learns and who she is and the way that we as readers hopefully connect to her, um, all that's part of the, the fiction section, you know, before we start to realize what's actually happening. Um, so I think, you know, there are a lot of things like that to talk about. Um, 
There is, of course, some Shakespeare in there as well. Yes. Because me and I'm almost box. incapable. Yeah. The, almost the, incapable of not doing. Um, so the, that the sense book of opens with Henry. Yeah. That 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 sense of the way a text, the way a novel or any kind of piece of art draws on things before it, so that it becomes a kind of layered uh, dialogue. Different things when you talk about songs or um, or the TV shows or movies that get referenced as part of her particular fandom, you know, mm-hmm. all become part of a dialogue about key issues. And you know, I, I and I do think that the there are serious conversations to be had about the way we represent heroism in yeah. in fantasy and sci-fi, right? Um, and sometimes with for example, I have become increasingly frustrated with superhero movies in which I feel that there's no consequence for anything. You know, that, 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 you know, the good guy and the bad guy can fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. And nothing ever seems to happen to anybody until the movie decides that it should. Right. And, and it's sort of, there's no logic to it. It's kind of a sort of cheap emotional manipulation, but it reinforces the sense that, again, how, the, 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 the fantasy is somehow completely divorced from the way we actually live. And I think that, you know, that's something worth talking about, uh, that wh- when you're working in, in a fantasy or science fiction world, just how separate is it or should it be from the reality we all experience. Is it supposed to be pure escapism? If so, for me, that gets old fairly fast. Yeah. You know? And I know that my view on that has changed over time and my writing has changed as a result. But, And I think it is something that if you're, if you're growing, you're constantly evaluating yourself and where you are and where you're going. Well, AJ, I'm thrilled with the book. I think it's one of the most powerful things I've ever read. Thank you. I think it's one of the most important things we've ever produced. Um, And, you know, we have some really strong endorsements in the notes from some other award-winning and best-selling authors who agree with us. Mm. So, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad it found a home and that people will be able to read it. Me too. And for those folks who are watching this at home, they can go right down below in the show notes and click on the link in the notes and they can pick up their copy in hardcover, paperback, or ebook right now. And the audio book will be coming later this year. Excellent. All right. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. Appreciate it. And for the rest of y'all, take care of each other, okay?